Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. That is one hell of a shirt. Thank you. I feel like I'm talking to two of you. There's two sets of eyeballs looking at me. <laughs> it's a lot of eyeballs. I like it. It's funky. Yeah. It's got some style. And I got a haircut from all the mountain stuff. I'm aware you're looking a little so, more... A little more presentable. But still mountainy. <laughs> you still have the mountain look. Yeah. So, today we're going to talk about something that's something a few people have actually commented on from our last episode. Yeah. If you remember in our last episode... What was that one? The Path to Bueno. Oh, yeah. So, in that episode, towards the end, we actually mentioned our systems thinking in the Alps, hiking in the Alps trip. Oh. Several people have commented, what the hell? Tell us more about that. Like, what does it mean? Why nature, systems thinking? What can we learn from nature um. about systems? What the hell were you actually doing relative to systems thinking? Yeah. People are wondering, you know, A, why would we do that? Yeah. What, what did we actually do? What did we actually learn? And I think what's interesting is you were the guide. Mm -hmm. I was temporarily your student. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I learned a lot. You probably learned a lot from guiding it. And also you had a plan of how you bring together these two worlds, your academic expertise in systems thinking and thinking generally, and you know, your wide your widespread expertise and knowledge about nature and guiding in nature and those kinds of things. I think you could think of it from a bunch of different angles, from a personal Mm -hmm. angle it's just my i have a deep desire to bring together two worlds that have been really meaningful to me so um the world of my early life uh as a mountain guide and mm -hmm. spending a lot of time in the mountains yeah um where i feel like uh i learned you know, so much about systems from the mountains. The mountains are such an amazing teacher uh, and nature is such an amazing teacher of systems and um, systems thinking in a yeah. sense. And and then my scientific life uh, as a professor and as a, you know, a, uh, a scientist and a researcher in complexity and systems thinking and system science and those those fields and you know just personally i want to bring those two together because they're yeah. they're they're both beautiful worlds that, yeah. I, that i've lived in and uh from a purely pedagogical uh or teaching point of view the mountains are just great teachers the mountains are the perfect medium to teach systems thinking in yeah um much better than a classroom or a, yeah. you know really anything even a even a a business or yeah you know we've taught in restaurants we've taught in businesses sure. we've taught in a lot of different environments but the mountains are just so dynamic yeah and so complex and yet so simple that they teach you know it's just like having a living right DSRP systems thinking classroom so well, yeah, and I'm wondering just before before we talk about this most recent trip, mm -hmm. I've had the benefit, and many people have heard mm -hmm. when you speak, you actually start with, you didn't start as a systems theorist, you actually started as a mountain guide, and yes. you, and and what you said in the beginning is, um, what you learned about systems you learned from nature, so maybe let's start at the beginning, yeah, of that relationship that you saw and how that took you on your path. And then we can talk about the kinds of things that I learned and that we talked about in the actual, the most recent trip, because I think a lot of people haven't had the benefit of, of that connection that you've talked about. Yeah. I mean, I think my first teacher was in systems was my father and, mm -hmm. and he um, grew up in the jungles of Colombia and, and was very, you know, love nature and things like that. And um, and so I think he taught a lot of those lessons early on. Um, and But then that love of, of nature and the jungles kind of transferred to the mountains for me, um, the high mountains. And, um, and that was, like you said, I mean, that was where, that's my alma mater. Yeah. The mountains are my alma mater. I mean, I, I went to Cornell and things like that and got my yeah. PhD and all that, but 
and Cornell's an alma mater as well. But but my real the alma mater that I f feel connected to is the mountains um, all yeah. of the world, and and you know it it felt like college to me. The, mm -hmm. the mountains felt like college, and it felt like where I learned to understand systems. And in large part, it was because <clears throat> as a young kid, like you know, 17, 18, 19, as an Outward Bound instructor um, and guiding in the Alps and different things in, uh, in, in Scotland and was um, just trying to get a handle on all these different systems that you have to keep track of, right? Mm -hmm. So not only you know, in the mountains, you have to keep track of the weather systems and the, right. the snowpack and what the snowpack is doing for avalanche danger and, you know, the geology of mountains. And, uh -huh. you know, so there's all the physical mountain stuff. And then there's all the gear that you have to deal with, right, for yeah. search and rescue systems and rope systems and, you know, uh, you know, you're just just the layering system that you wear in the mountains of your and, the, and the, yeah. of your clothing and the mm -hmm. way that those layers dynamically interact with each other to cause either warmth or coolness or, you know, stop you from sweating or get you sweating, you know, and um, or prevent you from getting wet or cause you to get wet. And, right. and you know, everything is so dynamic and so interrelated. And then there's the biophysical systems that you have to care about. You have to understand what's going on in your body and your metabolism and, you know, fuel the fuel the furnace so that you can keep climbing. And, um, and then on top of that, there's this whole other dimension of the social systems that you're yes. dealing with, whether you're guiding people or whether you're just with a group of people. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but like one of the re biggest reasons that expeditions fail isn't because of some technical challenge, like the challenge of the mountain, but yeah. it's actually because people on the expedition don't get along. So it's the um, social dynamics of expeditions that cause a lot of problems. Really? Yeah. yeah. So you have, you know, physics, the systems of physics, the systems of chemistry, the systems of biology, physiology, the systems of psychology. It's a mental game. I mean, a huge part of mountaineering yeah. is a mental game. That's true. Um, and then you've got, you know, metabolic systems and, you know, all those kinds of systems. And then you've got the social systems, you know, uh, and the dyadic dynamics of your partner climbing and then the the larger group dynamics when you're with larger groups and then you have all these meteorological systems you know like weather which also weather i learned so much from weather mm -hmm. i mean weather is i i i often think that every person who studies systems thinking and system science should study weather patterns oh. because weather at the micro and the macro level is so dynamic. It's so dynamic yeah. and so interrelated and everything is sort of relative to everything else, so, you know, whether yeah. you have cold or hot air masses or whether you have high pressure or low pressures at the macro level on the whole, you know, planet all the way down to micro yeah. regions, uh, you know, that are being, weather being caused by mountains and weather being caused by terrains and things like that. So, um, all of these systems that I just talked about have to be synthesized into one system of systems, not a yes. bunch of systems, right? Yeah. But a system of systems, what I call an SOS, a sauce. Because they're all connected. Rather than boss, right? Yeah. We, we, a lot of times we deal with a boss, a bunch of systems, but we need to deal with a sauce, a system of systems. You love your acronyms. I do love the acronyms. <laughs> but that's because they're all... Because separate, they're all, but they're actually very related. They're interconnected. And they, they and impact they, each and other. And they impact each other. And, like, you know, you can have one thing that leads to another thing. I mean, you know, a whole expedition can be just completely destroyed by, by uh, I mean, it sounds almost like a parable, but by, like, a pebble in your shoe. Oh, no, I believe it. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> right? Like, by, <laughs> you get a blister. Yeah. A blister really kind of is a bummer you know and it can and and like everything else could be going really great and your foot is just killing you you know or something like that so 
you know, kind of in a parable-like way, you've got to pay attention to the little things because the little things make the big things and you have to pay attention to the relationships and the interconnections between things because one thing leads to another and there's webs of causality. It's never just one thing. Right. It's usually a web of things. And everything in the mountains is like that. Everything is ecological. Everything is a web yeah. of interconnectedness. And you can't get away from those webs. You can't get away from that ecological interconnectedness, whether you're talking about the social group and the ecology of the social yeah. group, or whether you're talking about your metabolism, or whether you're talking about the snowpack, or whether you're talking about the weather. Right. Um, it's all interconnected and systemic. So right. teaching in that environment it's just kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, definitely. And I think also what's interesting is of all of those different interconnected systems, you have some influence over some of them mm -hmm. and no influence on on some on others. Yeah, that's a super great point too. Like I, I you know, early on, I think um, I learned it from Covey Mm -hmm. You know, when Covey Seven Habits or something, but I think it was actually Eisenhower that came up with it, and maybe Covey took it from Eisenhower. I'm not sure, but uh, the the idea of circle of influence versus circle of right. control, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the idea that that we work within our circle of influence, and and the more you work within your circle of influence, the more you um, the more you can affect the things you're concerned about, certain right. circle of concern. So lots of us have a very big circle of concern, but uh, you know we start with a yeah. pretty tiny circle of influence. Yeah. And then the more we focus on our influence, the more we can grow that influence. And some people, like the President of the United States, maybe has a, lo a bigger circle of concern than their circle, uh, a bigger circle of influence than, than their, their circle concern. of concern, right? right? Like the things they care about are yeah. smaller than the things that they have influence over. Right. So um, I think in the mountains, you know, you just, you just can't be a control freak. No, I learned that. <laughs> you just can't way. be. Like, yeah. And yeah, and you'll learn it the hard yeah. way if you try to be, because you're not in control. Like yeah. nature is in control, the weather is in control, the mountains yeah. are in control, and the beautiful thing is they're not controlling. So right. you know they're just doing their thing. They are what they are. They are what they are, and and I think love reality comes from that. Love reality yeah. comes from it's almost it's almost like something that the mountains teach you to love reality because yeah. you're not in control. You're a tiny speck on a very large mountain, which is somewhat ironically a tiny speck on a much larger yes. terrain well i think it's interesting yeah. because yes you can't be a control freak yeah. but <laughs> i mean i've just experienced this firsthand but there is a moment where it becomes very clear where you have some influence over your outcomes mm -hmm. so like how i tie my boots yeah the kinds of socks i wear how much I put my feet up at night to mm -hmm. sort of get the swelling mm -hmm. down and the blister, you know, like, so there's this funny moment. There was a funny moment for me where I was like, okay, these are the things that are just real and that I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with them, but here are the things I can do yeah, at, the, at my level yeah. to, uh, what's the word? Improve my experience, yes. right? Yes. To take care of the parts of the things that I can take care of. Yes. So there's that distinction that sort of happens at that moment. But yeah, no, the whole control freak thing is 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 big. I mean, and I think it's good. It's, it's really good. It's let me put it this way: it forces you to interact with the reality. And then, if you interact with that reality long enough, you learn to love it. Yes. And you learn to love not being in control. That's true. And 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 you learn to love being able to have whatever agency you do have, whatever influence you do have to determine your comfort and yes. your level of comfort. And that level of comfort isn't always guaranteed. And you and you start to realize that the the mental models that you make are hugely influential on yes, your level of comfort, your level of happiness and the changing environment doesn't have to affect the that 
attitude. You know, uh, it doesn't have to affect your the way that you perceive the world. You you get to choose a lot of that. I think that's right, and I think so. Just fast forward to the trip that we just took, mm-hmm. right? Um, the idea of there was a moment of acceptance of the natural discomfort that was part of the reality. But what's interesting is once you get to that point of realizing, oh, this part of this experience is going to be discomfort and also comfort. And then you embrace that and you move through it much differently than if you resist it. Mm -hmm. Because if you resist it and, and you, and you, and you force, you know, and you're sort of forcing yourself to you're trying to force your belief or your mental model on the reality. Mm-hmm. That's not, it's not work. It doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And that's the beauty of that immediate feedback, right? Yeah. Like the mountains are always, and nature generally, yeah. but I, I sort of think of it as the mountains, but the sea will teach you the same thing. And, you yes. know, the jungles will teach you the same thing. And the desert will teach you the same thing. But, but for me, it was mountains and, and, um, you know, the mountains just, they're going to give you feedback constantly because you're going to be bumping up against the reality of, of the environment that you're in. Yeah. You're, co- you're bumping up against the... Literally. Literally, every second of every day, you're bumping up against that reality and and realizing, you know, that, that you got to go with it. Not only that you have to go with it, but that going with it is going to make it easier. Yes. If you try to fight it, you will lose. It's much harder. <laughs> and you will lose. Which I love. Like, I love, <laughs> I, love I love that if you try to fight it, you'll lose. I think, I think everybody should learn that lesson. It's, it's actually, it sounds simple when you say it, <laughs> but in, the, in, an, in an experiential moment, it's actually a very transformative yeah. lesson to learn. And it actually then obviously translates into wider wider life yes it, it teaches you know, humility it teaches yeah. you know it rids us of hubris and um and it teaches you kind of like you were saying the the micro what I, what we say all the time in complexity science you know like a lot of the lessons that i learned in the mountains i kind of learned experientially and then found Mm. similar ideas in complexity science and the study of systems and system science so we we say all the time the micro makes the macro yes right the little things add up and create a web of causality to these macro level emergent properties right yeah so you know if you if you don't take care of all the little things they start to add up so you 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 start to learn experientially things like one of my favorite quotes is wash the glass like a baby Buddha, Mm -hmm. meaning something as sort of innocuous and seemingly unimportant as washing a glass. Imagine doing that with such care and such focus and such awareness and such attention that you were washing it as if it as if you were washing the baby Buddha. Right. Something as as sort of important and sacred as the baby Buddha. Yeah. But it's just a glass, right? So you're taking you're taking time and attention on how you tie your boots. How yes. you tie your boots. Like each lace can be tied differently yes. in order to get your boot to fit differently. Yes. Right? How you pack your pack. Mm-hmm. Is going to determine how comfortable it rides for the entire day. Yeah, it's every step defense. of every day. Yeah, of of your whole day, which could be, you know, fifteen twenty <laughs> miles worth of steps. Hours. Hours and hours and hours. That pack is going to be on your back, and the way it rides is going to be determined by the way you pack it in the morning. Well, and the outcome of that day is shaped by that decision yeah. at that moment. Yeah. I mean, my father unsuccessfully tried to get me to make my bed as a child, and um, it's, he, he was never, <laughs> much to his chagrin, you know, he was never successful with that. But, you know, the mountains taught me that when you get to camp and you get to your tent or you set up your tent or your camp, you have everything dialed. Everything yeah. goes in the same spot every night. I have a whole system for the way that I set up my camp, I yes. set up my tent, I set up my backpack. I set. I know where everything is at all times, because you know at night 
when it's dark and you need this little thing or that little thing, you you know, oh, it's this bag's zip. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. right there. I got it. You I know where everything you, is. I know where everything is. If it's, you know, downpour, I reach in on the right side, I pull my raincoat. I'm yeah. good. You know, I don't have to pack, unpack everything and get my down jacket wet and all kinds yeah. of other things wet. I just know where everything is. So you dial things in and you, you and that requires, ironically, awareness, yes. which is what we teach. Metacognition yes. is what yeah, we yeah. call it in science. And we know from the science that a, just a tiny bit of a metacognition can make huge differences in yeah. your personal and professional life. So you're learning those things, but you're learning them in a way that can't be denied. Two things relative to what you just said. So um, wash the glass like a baby Buddha is, is to me the best example of the way you do anything is the way you do everything, yeah. right? So the way you pack your pack, the way you make your bed, the way you do this, the way you do that, you need, you need to be thoughtful, right? And you need to mm -hmm. realize the second part is the way I pack my pack in the morning, mm -hmm. the effect of that is later. So there's a delay between the cause and the effect. Yeah. Cause and effect aren't neighbors on a timeline, as right. we say in system science, right? Right. Yeah. So the delay is a huge part of it, yeah. right? You, If you don't take care of the way you put on your socks and you have a wrinkle in your sock or you have a it's little deadly. burr in your sock, Yeah. Well, that that's not going to cause a blister right away. Mm -mm. It's going to cause a blister five hours from now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you don't wear gaiters or what I what what are sometimes called shorties, like little little gaiters, you know that that go a lot. That go. Sorry, maybe people don't know. No, what we gotta is. slow down for people because I didn't yeah, know what so they were. Yeah, so gaiters are gaiters are used sometimes. They, there's long ones that go from your knee all the way down to your boot, or there's short ones that we call shorties that just cover the top of your boot. The long ones are for snow and things like that. So they're little things that you put around your ankles. That connect either to your shoes yep. or your sock, and they they keep stuff from going into your yeah. shoe. Yeah. So when you're hiking, you're gonna get little rocks and little burrs and little things, pine needles or what, whatever is in the environment, or or just snow, mm -hmm. um, which is gonna you know over time can make your socks wet, and then that makes your feet wet, which makes them more blister prone. And you know, so Sorry. again, all these little yeah interactions, um, but again, there's delay. There's delay in all these systems, right? Yeah. So if you don't do those things with the understanding of how things are interconnected, right? Then if you don't drink water before you're thirsty, thirst, for example, is a is a late signal yeah. Yeah. of dehydration, yeah. right? So people say all the time, I have a headache, I have this, I have that, I don't feel, what, drink water. We say all the time, drink, drink water. Yeah. When you're done drinking water, drink some water. The answer to you everything know, is drink the water. The answer to everything in the mountains is drink water, <laughs> drink water. right? Because, yeah. because there's this delay, and and your body can't really function well if it's not hydrated, and and yeah. there are all these forces that are dehydrating you. Well, and I think that it's not something that people understand, which is often the out like the outcome. So in the mountains, the outcome of your day. Starts in the morning when you're repacking your <laughs> yeah. pack, when you're putting your boots on. And the on. night before. And, right, yeah. but the outcome of the trip started two months ago yes. when you bought all of the stuff, when we got all the stuff we needed and made sure we had a checklist of the stuff that we were going to need when we were on the mountain. Yes. But in, in real life, people, I don't think people realize that there there is usually a delay between a cause and an effect. For sure. That, that the thing you're experiencing today, that probably started a long time ago. Yeah. Right? And, and so it's about challenging that widespread belief. It's about challenging the mental model that you have at that moment, which is this is happening right now. Suddenly syndrome. Yeah, right? suddenly Suddenly syndrome. syndrome is, you know, then suddenly, yeah. you know, I suddenly I got a blister. Suddenly I got a headache. Suddenly I got a divorce. Suddenly I got you know my kids yeah. a drug addict. Suddenly, all these things happen to us. Yeah. Suddenly I lost my job. Suddenly, well, most things don't happen. Most things don't happen suddenly. Most things have a web of causality that lead yeah. to them over time. Over time, slowly they happen. So our 
you know, the mountains teach this stuff whether you like it or not. They almost guarantee learning. Yeah. Because the pain, because what it'll do is it'll just increase the pain. And, you know, we learn when we suffer. When we suffer. But <laughs> the thing is, it's up to you whether or not you listen. And it's up to you whether you suffer. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, yes, it's up to you whether or not you suffer. But it's also up to you whether or not you listen to what it's teaching you. Mm -hmm. And that's true every day. Life. That's what love reality is. The feedback is all about. we're getting, we can either listen to it yeah. or not. Yeah. If you listen to it, you're going to evolve, you're going to learn, you're going to do better. Yeah, I mean, and then the other thing, I mean, so we're talking about some of these real basal things. The other thing that the mountains do really, really well is they teach DSRP really well. Yes. You know, like when you're out there, you see DSRP in action Everywhere. because nature's doing DSRP all the time. Mm -hmm. Nature, Nature's distinguishing and not distinguishing. Nature is grouping things and breaking things apart. Nature is action, reaction all day right. long. And nature is perspectival, right? Nature is, there's so many different things in the ecology that are kind of do, working their way through the system. That's right. And um, That's right. all those things have perspective. Nature exists in DSRP. We think in DSRP. There's this, you know, the idea that we build mental models to approximate reality. Reality is nature, right? So when, when we're thinking about these things, there's all kinds of things that nature can teach us about our own selves and, and obviously everything else that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I was thinking about is when I got back from the trip, I started to think about what are the sort of big lessons that I, I personally learned mm -hmm. or saw in nature. One of them was the one that you sort of talked about in the beginning, which I think was, to me, the most obvious, which is the micro makes the macro. Mm -hmm. And the way that that played out was when there were moments that were hard on the trail, and I would look up and see how far we had to go, you literally said, just focus on one step at a time. So the, so the idea is, you know, if you focus on the micro when the when the macro was overwhelming, that's how you get to the to the to the goal, to the vision, to the summit. Yeah, I mean, the mountaineers have a thing called we call the mountain rest step, which mm -hmm. is literally kind of placing your body weight on your skeletal system for a, sometimes a micro second to take uh, weight off of your muscular system, right? Yeah. So you, you, there's a particular way you kind of configure your body in between each step and sometimes that step is very quick yeah from step to step mm -hmm. but sometimes that step like at altitude that step might be you might be taking several breaths in between each step which makes it even more important to have to have your weight on your skeletal system so you kind of lock your knee mm -hmm. in the mountain rest step um hard to describe in words but easy to show like in yeah you know in walking but yeah. But the idea is that, um, you know, really you, you climb mountains one step or one handhold at a, at a time. You know, you don't, yeah. you don't get overwhelmed by swallowing the whole elephant. Uh, you, you take one bite at a time kind of thing. And yeah. eventually, if you keep taking one step, repeat, there won't be any more steps to take. That You'll be at the top. I mean, what's interesting is... So before we le left for the trip, I was like, oh, I'm going on this trip. And I just kept thinking my unit of analysis was the trip. And then I got there and I was like, oh, we're going to get to this hut. Mm -hmm. And then it became, oh, I'm going to get up this hill. Mm -hmm. And then as it got harder, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get up the next 100 feet. Mm -hmm. And then it got to, I'm just going to take a step. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to keep taking steps. And then eventually I'll get there. But when something is hard like that, um, or challenging, I should say, having that ability to see that that micro, literally, and you know, one thing at a time, one thing at a time, which allows you to focus, that's how you're going to get to the outcome you want when it's when you're struggling, when you're challenged. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it 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 starts to seem impossible, and then your mental models take over, and then your fears take over, and then you actually get into a space where you're actually probably not going to be able to do it, mm -hmm. right? Because you're you're focused outside of that moment of step to step to step. Yeah. 
And and you start you start to realize, or maybe you don't until until you do, but uh, you start to realize how much of it is a mental game. Yes, that's yeah, the other thing. I have a I have a, a good friend that was in professional baseball, and you know it, when he, when he left professional baseball, big it wasn't necessarily the the game itself. It was the, the mental game. A lot of times, people don't realize like a, a huge part of working at a high level is your mental game, mm-hmm. and mountaineering is a huge mental game because if you let that mental thing start you know like that hamster start running that wheel you won't finish you won't climb anything it's just (laughs) just it'll wreak (laughs) havoc you know yeah it'll be like yeah i'm not gonna make it or yeah blah 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 and you'll you'll find every reason not not to do it Mm -hmm. you know and and that's probably why a lot of people don't do it you know is yeah because of that so the mental game is huge and it's a system and it's a system that that you also are not in control of. So all the things we said about the mountain is true of the mind. Oh, that's true. And uh, and and so learning that you're not in control of this thing, you have influence. Yeah. But it's doing a bunch of stuff that you have no idea what it's doing or why it's doing it. It's feeling a bunch of stuff. It's afraid of a bunch of stuff. It's you're building whole worlds yeah. that you're not even aware of. And the more that you can get a little bit of awareness, a little bit of metacognition, a, a, a little bit of understanding the DSRPs that you're doing, then the more you can have some influence over which direction it takes you and yes. what things you feel and don't feel and what things you, you, what predictions you make and what decisions you make. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about mental models for a bit Yeah, because that was one of those um uh, pretty pivotal kind of lessons. So I, I obviously know that we're always building mental models. Mm-hmm. I obviously know that we have the ability to um, take feedback in, evolve, and change our mental. I'm, you know, I'm pretty aware of mental models and metacognition. Yeah, that's your profession. That's actually yeah. what I do. <laughs> and that being said, um, as we're doing something that's challenging, one of the things that was interesting was helping other people with their mental models. Mm -hmm. Like, you can do this. Because the minute you believe you can't, then you actually probably can't, right? Mm -hmm. You can do this. Um, Any kind of uh, moment where, and, and what was interesting is in some people in the group, you see a moment where what they're thinking isn't matching the reality of the situation. And so, you know, we do the work to say, well, here's what's real. You're going to have to take another step, another step. We're going this much further. We're going to get there. We just have to stay focused and, and, and keep the mental game going. And the other thing was not just about how you thought about the challenges, but what people were afraid of. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be fair, myself included, having never experienced the experience, having fears seemed completely rational at the time because it was unknown, Yeah. right? So if you imagine, and I'll be specific, if you imagine the first time where you're on a a path and there's a drop where I guess you call it exposure. Yes. And you think, I mean, we'll talk about this for a minute, but like you think that if you lose your footing at all, you're gonna tumble down that whole hill and die. Yeah. And we had this exchange on the trail, right? Where I, where I was, I didn't realize I was afraid of heights until very late in life. And I didn't realize it. I just didn't know it until the first time I was sort of out and about. And what's interesting about fears, like you were saying is, it's not a mental model I can, it's not something I can control. Meaning the fear comes, but what I can control is my mental model about how I'm going to get through it. Yeah, I mean, and you can you can kind of question some of the mental models that are driving the fear, right? So yes. if if you're if you're on a trail, the trail's you know 36 inches wide. Yeah. And you have, you know, a thousand or two thousand feet of exposure on your left, right? Exposure meaning you know it goes down. Yeah. 
2,000 feet on the left. Yeah. You know, people that are, aren't used to that are going to be keep looking there and keep thinking, if I fall, if I make any misstep... I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm going to fall 2,000 feet to my death. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is that true? Uh, if you fall on a 36-inch wide trail, most of the time you're going to just kind of like drop down on your butt. On the trail. On the trail. Yeah. Right? So sometimes I'll say to people, like, do a little kind of pretend fall mm -hmm. here. And let's test, obviously, you know, on the if you fall on the side of a, a rock face, you know, that's different. But yeah. in this particular situation, there is exposure. And it's true. If you leapt off that trail, you would fall 2,000 feet to your death. Mm -hmm. But... You know, chances are that's not really, it's not going to be like Princess Bride where you just kind of, in the movie, where yeah. they just keep rolling <laughs> yeah. and rolling and rolling yeah. down the hill. Like, small things are going to stop your fall. And, you, and you're probably just going to kind of like become a clump on the trail. That's probably what's going to happen. Right. I'm going to die. Yeah, probably. I mean, like, you know, I'm not I'm not saying you can't fall off of a trail and and and, yeah. and that exposure yeah. isn't scary. It is. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of temper the mental model that's driving it because we have these imaginations. Yeah. And the, our imagination is if I make one misstep at whatsoever, it's over. It's over. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Yeah. I'm dead. I'm going to die. Yeah. Well, that's probably not true. Right. So let's take that So that example. So we're on a 36-inch wide trail, which yeah. is not that wide, by the way. <laughs> Pretty wide, if you think about it. Like, imagine, for example, if you're on a balance beam. Yeah. And the balance beam is this much, like, a you know, a, right? And you go, oh, that's pretty thin. That's thinner than my foot. Yeah. Now make a 36-inch wide balance beam. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, okay, it's wide. It's wide. 36 enough. inch wide balance beam, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you're like, I could probably walk this. Right, so let's. So but now put that 36 inch wide balance beam in between two Eiffel Towers. Yeah. And then it becomes scary. Yeah. But it's the same 36 inch wide yeah. balance beam, right? If I put a. Think of it this way. If I took a 36-inch board and I put it on your driveway mm -hmm. flat, yeah. you would walk across that board like it was nothing. Yeah, I wouldn't even think about you it. You wouldn't even think about it. But if I put a 36-inch board between two buildings 5,000 feet up... It's very different. All of a sudden, that 36-inch board feels scary. Yes, but in my defense, <laughs> no, it's not a criticism. In the Eiffel Tower example, yeah. the mental model that if you fall, you die is wrong is right. Yes, in that, that case, that in that case, the mental model is right. Well, no, not really. If you fall off the board, <laughs> if you fall onto the board, you're fine. Which is thirty six inches yeah. wide. Yeah, that's right. You're not gonna die. That's true. You're gonna just fall onto the board. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you let's, see what I'm saying? Yeah. So. If you imagine falling where where you're going downward, what we imagine is somehow that that physics doesn't happen, that the physics launches you into space. <laughs> yes. Right? That's our imagination of yeah. what's going to happen. Right. If I, fall, if I trip. Yeah. But the reality but is... The reality is you're going to kind of just kind of go down in a clump. Yes. That's right. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, again, I'm not saying that th that it's that there's not possible. You know, if you're walking on snow, and the snow collapses under your feet, well, then that's different. That's the trail collapsing, right? Yeah. You know, so I'm not I'm not saying that th there aren't dangers. There are no, dangers. No, 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 no. I'm I'm simply saying that uh, sometimes our imagination gets away from us and yeah, so, we start thinking all these crazy things so let's talk through the psychology of the moment on yeah. the trail because i think it's interesting so we're walking i have a mental model which is that if anything goes wrong in the slightest moment i'm gonna roll down and die yeah that's not actually true no but that's what i believe 
so then I'm walking, and then I actually, without intention, lost my footing and fell on the trail. Yep. At that moment that I fell on the trail, that was real world feedback that, hey, by the way, your mental model's wrong. Yeah. You're not going to fall down and die, right? So then I was able to get back up and micro makes the macro, focus on one step at a time and get through, get over that fear part and just focus on getting, yes. getting through it, yeah. right? The other thing that was nice that I thought was interesting was there was a moment where without speaking, the entire group of 12 people, without, without any speaking, started taking care of the one behind them. Yes. So there's like this emergent thing where everyone was in the same situation. We all had different levels of fear. We all had different mental models. Some of us, like you, are like a mountain goat and you can do anything, you're not afraid, right? But there was this sort of inherent thing that happened where we realized collectively that we were all in a situation and we needed to help each other. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really um, a nice example of how those things can sort of just happen naturally based on the environment and the feedback that the environment was giving us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But one thing that nature really does reinforce is the idea of your mental models, the degree to which they're aligned with it, and then it will, as you said, give you feedback, and then you can revise and deal with it differently, go through it differently. Yeah. Right? It does. So to me, nature teaches you micro makes the macro. It teaches you really sort of firsthand when your mental models are a little out of whack. It gives you some sort of feedback that gets them back into whack. And then um, you take that up further and you, and you realize everything you're doing is a mental model, right? Mm -hmm. Terrified fear of a Ferrata is a mental model. And then your favorite one, there's more in you than you know. Because our mental model is that we can't do things. And then you're, you know, you challenge that and you say, well, there's more in you than you know. If you start to believe that, you'll push that was uh, That was Kurt Hans. Oh, really? Yeah, he's the founder of Outward Bound. Um, he, he was fond of saying there's more in you than you know. And there it is. There's way more in you and all of us than we know. And the mountains teach us that. You know, you think that you can't do something and then you do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you do something that stretches your mind, your mind doesn't go back. It, once you've stretched the mind, it it stays stretched, you know. And then you redefine what is challenging, which is why challenge is so important. Challenging ourselves constantly is important because it expands the mind and it expands what we're capable of. And it changes that sort of base level of mental models about yourself, right? So yeah. now I'm like, oh, I did that. So now I can go and do this. Yeah. So you're building off of the prior experience. Yeah, I mean, once you did time. the roped pass, you know, that was pretty steep and, and you kind of were doing some climbing. It was climbing terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was terrifying. But you'll notice once you did that, yeah. walking on a trail with exposure was like a piece of cake. Yeah, that felt easy. That afterwards. felt easy. Yeah. Like, so... Yeah. That was the day before scary. Yeah. Then you did something scarier. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that wasn't scary anymore. So now Yeah. you you can walk all day on trails with exposure. Yes, that's right. Right. Our mental models are are very powerful and it sort of shows you how powerful your mental models are. Yeah. Cuz that trail with exposure didn't change. No. What changed was your mental model. Of it and of, of myself. Of it and of yourself and of your abilities. So the trail didn't change. The The mountains didn't change. Yeah. But that, that can be extracted to life generally. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's why you say that the mountains are the best place to learn about yeah. everything. Because everything you learn, everything you learn in the mountains totally transfers into the rest of your life. Yes. I mean, without any effort at it's all. It's a near perfect metaphor yeah. for life. And then the whole no challenge, no change. 
kind of thing. Like if you don't challenge yourself, you're never going to change. You're never going to grow, even if it's hor horribly terrifying. That's right. Some of the challenges, but if you get through them, then you can do a whole another set of them, which is yeah. great. Yeah. All right. So we talked a lot. We started in the beginning where you were saying everything you learned about systems you learned in nature. Not everything, but a lot. Well, like, yeah. A yeah. lot of what you learned. A lot of the, a lot of the early, you know, introduction to systems. Yeah. So, what would you say if people said, okay, so, what's the takeaway from all of this? Why do we learn about systems in nature? Why is nature our greatest teacher? Why should we do things like we just did? Like, what's what's the point? Well, I mean, I think it's like if you're going to teach a class on cooking, mm -hmm. you should probably do it in a kitchen. Yes. Right? It's like, real. it's harder to teach cooking mm -hmm. in the living room. True. So if you're going to teach a class on systems, it's pretty good place to teach is the mountains because it's all systems. And it's it's not like manufactured human mechanical systems that are that can be isolated and and you know nothing in the mountains is isolated. Everything is interconnected. Everything is a web. Everything is relative to everything else. I mean, that's why weather is such a powerful uh, thing to learn about. Is every high pressure is relative to some low pressure? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Every hot environment is relative to some cooler environment. Right. Mm -hmm. So heat is relative. Cold is relative. Everything's relative. Interesting. Everything's rela relative means you know related. Yeah. Everything is. Every, everything that we think of as high is relative to something low. Every ridge has a valley. You know, everything has some other thing that's causing it to, to come into existence. Hmm. And when we think about distinction systems, relationships, and perspectives, or DSRP, I think one of the things that I love about seeing it happen in the mountains seeing the mountains do DSRP yeah. is as soon as the mountains do DSRP, they undo it. What do you mean? It's dynamic. It's, it's yeah. the idea that you never step into the same uh, river twice. You know, it's, it's so dynamic. I mean, I, I was on a course in the Sierra Nevada and there's this huge wall, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a place that we do a, a thing called the King's Repel. It's a big repel. It's a free yeah. hanging repel, right? Yeah. So you're, you're literally hanging in the air. Well, the reason you're hanging in the air is because a huge chunk of this wall, and, and when I say huge, I mean bigger than a building size oh, rock oh, wow. yeah. fell out of this wall. Well, that rock that, fe that used to be part of the wall yeah. is now a huge like bigger than a building size rock. Mm -hmm. So we distinguish that rock. At one point it was part of the wall, but now it's this absolutely massive boulder. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's cool. And nature distinguished, right? The, the things, mm -hmm. are, things are distinguishing themselves. At the same time, that rock is sitting on a beach, which is made up of sand. Uh-huh. Which used to be rocks. That's quite that have just been completely <laughs> eroded. Yeah. Right? And now are tiny, tiny pieces of sand which make up a beach, a part hole system, right? So so that rock someday will be sand. Yeah. That huge rock, which used to be part of a face, indistinguishable from the face, yeah. is now distinguishable as this huge boulder and will someday become Something else. Beach yeah. sand. Yeah. Right? The beach in the middle of the yeah. wilderness. Next on a river. This isn't an ocean beach. It's a like a river yeah, beach, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, trees clump together. They're they're individuated, but then they clump together to survive. Krumholtz communities at high altitudes cl clump together to survive the, the yeah. gale force winds and the biting snow. And um you know, the roots of a of a anything are like the relationship between the thing that 
plant and the soil. Yeah. But then you realize that there's an even there's another relationship between those roots and the soil, which is the hyphal mats, the hyphae, the fungal hyphae yeah. that create a relationship between the roots and the soil. So you're just constantly sort of seeing the fractal nature of the fractal and temporal nature of the mountains. Right. And so the mountains distinguish and then they undistinguish. The mountains, they, 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 they break stuff apart and then they lump them together. Every action is the reaction of yeah. some other action. Yeah. Right? And then has a subsequent reaction. Mm -hmm. And everything is perspectival from where you're sitting, whether you're sitting, you know, whether you're the soil or whether you're the elk or whether you're the wolf or whether you're the, yeah. the plant. Yeah. So it's just so dynamic. Nothing is static. In nature. But everything is DSRPing constantly yeah. in yeah. this flow. And that's what your brain is doing. Your brain's doing that. And it's very dynamic. And because we're, we want to control, we lock things in. Mm -hmm. We get locked in. Yeah to one way of doing things, to one way of thinking about things. But your brain is very fluid and yeah. can do things and is doing things, whether you like it or not, in a very fluid and dynamic way. Yeah. I think that's interesting because it's this parallelism between your mind and nature. And I think we say that quite a bit, and it's probably confusing to people. Mm -hmm. But what you're what you're getting at is if you use nature and reality as sort of synonymous, mm -hmm. things exist in DSRP. Things are distinguished. Things are organized into systems. Things relate to each other. Perspectives, all of that. And so there's that. And then there's how we think about those things. And the way we think about them is we make distinctions. We organize things into systems. Mm -hmm. We make relationships. We take perspectives. And I think that parallelism is exactly why I don't know if you, if I'm hearing you right, which is why you're saying nature is the best place to learn it because of that symmetry or that parallelism. Yeah, I mean the parallelism is already there because of evolution, right? Our brain our brains didn't develop like separate from the universe. Our, right. our brains didn't develop separate from this planet, even with gravitational forces and all you know the things that that apply just to this planet. Our mm -hmm. brains evolved within. The evolution yeah. of of everything, and so um, it's not like our brains kind of took a different structure than the rest of evolution. Right. You know, it 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 took a structure that was part of evolution, <laughs> and and part of the reality and the fabric of reality. So it it it's not like our brains are programmed differently than reality. It, the right. only difference is. We can make shit up. Yes, we That's, can. Right? So all we want to do is try to get our brain mm -hmm. to be in alignment with reality. And reality is giving us feedback all the time. So it, it's helping us get in alignment with it. But our brains can have hallucinations just like AI has hallucinations. Right? Our brains can, can do all kinds of things. We can be afraid of things that we don't need to be afraid of. We cannot be afraid of things that we do need to be afraid of. Right? We, yeah. we can... We can have uh, in effect hallucinations yeah biases yeah. fears hmm. right aversions emotions all these different things right so we want to just try to get our brain in alignment with the reality and the great thing is your brain and reality speak the same structural language which is dsrp yeah and that allows us to get in alignment yeah and that and the mountains teach us that the mountains show us that. The mountains give us examples of that. The mountains give us feedback that help us reconcile that. Well, the mountains give you that feedback in real time exactly when it matters in a yeah. way that you have to listen to it. Yes. Right? Which is why I think it's such a unique experience. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Yeah. That is the mountains. You yeah. know, the, the mountains will teach you exactly what you need to learn when you need to learn it. And if you don't learn it, they'll teach it again. 
And hopefully you'll learn it that time. <laughs> and if you don't learn it, they'll teach it again. Yep. They're imminently patient. Yeah. Because they've been around for a long time. They have. That's true. And they give zero fucks. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> they, they, the no fucks given. You're like, the mountains don't care. The mountains don't really care. They just exist. They just exist. Hmm. Like, they don't care. They're not like... People say, you know, oh, it's, it's trying to keep, the mountains are trying to kill me. No, they're not. They're, they're just not. being mountains. They're just being mountains. It's kind of like they're, Bruno. Bruno's just being a dog. Yeah. Like, they're not <laughs> They're not trying to make your life difficult. They're not, you know, not trying to make your life difficult. They're just being, they're just existing. They just are. And you're existing in them. And uh, and they're, they're giving feedback because they're existing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not personal. No. At all. No, but I think the crux of it is listening, purposefully choosing to listen. 100%. And then evolving how you're thinking about things based on what you heard. To me, that's that's like the nugget of being out in the mountains and learning from them is. Yeah, and it's not, you know, when we think of listening, we think of these little things, yeah, it's right? Like it's not just listening with your ears. It's turning your whole f person into a sail. Yeah. You know, like if you think about deer, they have these really big ears and they kind of turn yeah. them like a sail towards the sound. Yeah. It's making your whole person into a sail, your whole mind, your whole body, your whole, uh, your whole being into a sail and really listening mm -hmm. to what it, the feedback is. Taking it in. Taking it in. Yeah. Feeling your body, feeling your mind, feeling your feelings, feeling all all the different things that you're sensing. Right. And and when you do that, the system will tell you about itself. And the then, system yeah. will tell you about itself. Yeah. And then you'll understand the system. And then you can work within that system. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm always amazed when you look at... In, in foreign countries, you look at uh, like these crazy intersections where there's going all kinds of crazy traffic. And you'll see a, an old woman just like in Vietnam or in mm -hmm. Bangladesh or, so, you know, old woman will just slowly walk across looking straight down at the ground. There's zooming traffic everywhere. Yeah. And they'll just walk across. Well, why is she able to do that? Whereas as a tourist is like trying to run from yeah. place to place and usually causing all kinds of havoc. And well, it's because that work. woman understands the system. Yeah. She understands there's simple rules to the way that traffic pattern is moving. And if she goes slowly, the traffic will avoid her because each individual agent has a rule, which is avoid the other. Right. But if, if you go quick across that system, which is what a lot of Westerners think. We, yeah. we have a mental model that the, the less time we spend in this chaotic space, the better we'll be, right? Yep. But that's not how that system works. So if your mental model is in alignment with that system, then you can live in that Fine. system all day long. Right. But if your mental model is out of sync or out of alignment with that system, then you're going to be in danger in that system. Yeah. Because right? your reality and your thinking aren't matching up. Exactly. And I think that's the case with everything. If you if you if you look at the mountains, if you look at I mean, I, I'm not a big ocean guy. I'm a mountain guy. <laughs> yeah. But I was watching a thing the other day about sharks and like, you know, this woman she just kinda like turns towards the shark in the water, this huge dangerous shark, and turns right at him and then just puts her hand on his nose and pushes it down as oh, yeah? she's, yeah. Well, that's a woman that understands that system. Yeah. Right? And so she's safe in that system because she understands. Now, I'm sure there are 17 different things she could do that not understanding that system would put her in great danger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if her mental model's in alignment with that system because she's been listening to that system. Yeah and getting the feedback from that system, then she's going to be fine. But if it's out of alignment, she's splashing at the surface and looks like a, you know, injured seal. And then she's... Then that shark is baked. literally oh. going to come and, and all of a sudden she's in danger. She's lunch. She's lunch. That's not good. It, it really is that simple. And I think all of life is that way. 
It's just all of life is that way. It can be very simple if you're listening. I think that's a great place to end. That's a great, I might write that one down. It can be simple if you're listening. That's that's pretty heavy. It is? And yeah, no, not heavy. Um, it's meaningful. Yeah. It can be simple if you listen. Because if you listen, you can be in sync. Yeah. With reality. And then everything's going to be different. But not listen like in school where they hit no, you with no, a stick if you're not listening. Not that's that kind of listening. <laughs> I was not hit by sticks. It's like, <laughs> no, like listening, like yeah. really deeply under, listening to the system because the system is constantly teaching you about itself. Yes. And that's the same for corporations. Like if you're in an organization, like the organization's teaching you about itself all the time. Mm. Or your children. Your children are teaching you about themselves all the time. That's true. If you're listening. Yeah. Not listening to argue, not listening to be right. Listening to what the system is telling you. Yeah. We always say this to our students, like, you know, stop trying to solve problems and start understanding systems. Yes. And the best way to understand a system is listen. Mm -hmm. Again, not with your ears. Listen to what the system's telling you about itself because it's constantly giving you feedback. Well, I think that we. Is that a wrap? I think that we more than answered the hey, tell us a little bit more about, <laughs> about the trip the question. Trip. Yeah, that, that was a lot. <laughs> Which is good. Um, kind of went all over the place. You know, that's how it is when you're talking about the mountains and nature. And we went all over the place in the Alps. So that's, that's good. That's true. We've paralleled it. Get out in the mountains and, if, you know, join us next year on our trip. But buy the right shoes. <laughs> yes, we can help you with the shoes. All right, we'll see you next time. See ya.